So before starting, a big hello and thank you for coming. Bienvenue tout le monde qui ici. Um, this is going to be a presentation in English, but if there are any questions whatsoever, si tu es plus à l'aise par les français, just ask away in French or in English, okay? So we're going to go over this presentation, Matthew and I. This is something that we delivered originally at the ProSeed conference, um, and it really gives you a good overview of our AGE support guide. And we'll go into a little bit more detail about what that means. So let me start off with the introduction. So this is how the presentation is going to look today. We're going to start off with an introduction. After that, Matthew's going to talk a little bit about challenges around our adult learners, any of them that you know have any difficulties and that sort of thing, or some common difficulties that we all have. We'll go into a, a deeper look into looking at the adult support guide. Then we're going to talk about implementing the support guide and what that looks like in different centers. Uh, we'll give you some links for some resources. And then since we're a smaller group, we can spend more time on number six, which is the Q&A. And Matthew and I are going to be bouncing back and forth between the different sections of this presentation. So if there's any questions, just feel free to ask them in the chat. And then, like I said, we'll open up the floor towards the end for the questions. So intro. Um, I do want to start off by talking a little bit about our team that put together this document. Um, I'll start off with myself. So my name is Abby Spector. I'm a C consultant. I have a mandate around accessibility and inclusive tech. I'm based out of the Riverside School Board. And uh, a lot of the work that I've been doing the last two years revolves around accessibility and inclusive tech. Um, Carrie Bremer is supposed to be here today. She had to go to something at the last moment, so I'll introduce her. She's a special education consultant also at my board at the Riverside School Board, and she has a foot both in the youth sector and adult sector. And Matthew, maybe you can introduce yourself and Casey. Hello, good evening. My name is uh, Matthew Kennedy. I'm a pedagogical consultant at Lester B. Um, my dossiers are social integration and socio-vocational integration in um, at PAC Adult Center in LaSalle and Place Carche Adult Center in Beaconsfield. I also provide support to the resource um, team at Place Carche. Um, Casey uh, Finn Lefserud is the readaptation officer at uh, Place Carche and her role as much as a, a resource teacher except for adult education. So exam accommodations, um, uh, in, in um, IEP style documents uh, for supporting students with uh, learning difficulties and and uh, disabilities um, in the classroom. So Thanks, that, that, that's us. <laughs> and then or there's she, Shanna. Exactly. And Shanna says teacher, but she, for any of those who work with her, she wears many hats, does many different things. So what's really neat is that we're a multi school board team um, who put together this document. Some of these other folks here, I uh, want to give a thanks to them out loud. Nicole, Mark, Karine Jacques, Marc Brisson, both Marks are here today. Thank you. The resource and student services at PAC, Cartier, Access, New Horizons. Again, it really took a village to put together this document. And we really do want to start with a, a thank you to everybody. I know everyone wants to get started, but there you go. Um, this presentation is available if you want to access it after the presentation or right now. You can scan the QR code with your phone, or you can go to bit.ly slash APC. 2022 ASG. All right, today's goal, starting off with the goal. We're going to be going over our, it's a mouthful, guide for ensuring consistent and effective support for adult learners with special needs. We never call the guide this. It's way too long. I think Matthew and I, when we were with the team, Matthew's like, no one's going to remember that. Well, let's, let's shorten that down. So we decided to call it the AGE support guide. And my little joke I like to make in presentation, since we're in adult ed, we love our acronyms, we call it the ASG for short, okay? So we'll be referring to it a lot today um, as the ASG. The ASG is um, a set of guidelines. It's not a directive. It's really important to know when you go through there. And we're going to give you a moment um, midway through the presentation, about five minutes or so, to go through the guide and take a look at it um, to see what it's like. And this is important too, we often get this question, it's really intended for adult general education, for AGE. It does not apply to VOC Ed. So I'm gonna hand things over to Matthew and Matthew's gonna talk about some common challenges we have in AGE. So go ahead, Matthew. 
Okay, so uh, since adult learners are coming to us at um, any point in their lives as of age 16, uh, it's possible that a student will come to us and not disclose that they have um, a disability of some kind. Um, this is in contrast to in the youth sector where you'd automatically receive that uh, documentation confirming as much um, through IEP meetings and such. Uh, in adult education, it is possible that um, a student will register for classes and not um, inform us that they have uh, a disability. And some adult learners have disabilities, but they may be undiagnosed. They um, may have um, a reading difficulty and not know it. Um, so that presents another challenge for us in adult education, especially since we don't necessarily have the tools to um, diagnose these disabilities ourselves. So further to these challenges of either not knowing if a student has a disability or them not knowing if they have a disability, it can also, um, and, and so the identification can be a challenge, right? Especially for the lack of um, professionals within our resource who could do that, um, but also accompanying the students with uh, a disability or some kind of special need can be challenging, um, especially if you don't know that they, uh, that they have one. So in our experience, in, the, in our experience, each center that we've worked with um, or, uh, you know, with, uh, with whose um, uh, staff members we've consulted with, they, we've learned that they do support adult learners, right? I haven't encountered a, um, a center where they're like, oh yeah, we don't do that here. Everyone does mm -hmm. and everyone tries, right? Um, but they all have different approaches and procedures for supporting their adult learners, um, which in many ways is great, but in other ways, it's, it's good to know what other centers are doing so we can share best practices. So what exactly is this guide? You keep talking about it. Let's dig a little bit deeper about what's exactly in it. So we came up with one slide. Like you can't really summarize 44 pages in one slide, but it's really kind of this. It's guidelines, terminology and procedure. So when we, if we unravel that a bit, um, it talks a lot about support plans, like the adult ed equivalent of an IEP. Um, it talks a lot about assistive tech. It talks about what are the roles that you might have in your center or school board when we're supporting our adult learners with special needs. So that's really the 44 page guide in a one slide. Where it came from uh, is interesting. When I first started this role two years ago, I quickly discovered that in the French sector, there's already um, a document, which is even more of a mouthful than the English one, which we like to just call the ligne directrice, okay? And that's available for the uh, AG, well, I should say FGA centers in the French sector, all the stuff that we're talking about. And the idea really is to make sure that everyone's on the same page in terms of supports and support plans and terminology and all the stuff that I mentioned previously. But in English adult ed, as Matthew said, all our students are supportive and everyone's sort of going about it maybe in a different way, or maybe they're using this document, maybe they're not. So really that's what we did is we said, okay, you know what we're gonna do? We're gonna bring this into English adult ed. Um, so I was able to procure a professional translator to translate the document. And then we had these amazing individuals, the ones you saw on the slide before, um, who really got together and we spent on my back balcony and centers and whatnot. We picked it apart word by word to really give it um, a really nice adaptation for the English sector. A lot of love was given into this document. So who does the guide help, the ASG? We wrote over here, adult learners with special needs or who otherwise experience academic difficulties. And this is one of the debates we had. We're like, do we really wanna go with the term special needs? Um, we don't wanna disparage anybody. We're not really sure if that's what we wanna use. We have the opportunity to change it. But really this multi-school board team, when we started really talking about things, that's how our students self-identify. They have special needs. And it could be any of these things. It's an umbrella term for, we just made a nice little word cloud, any of these, things that you're seeing up on the screen. So we decided that it's not disparaging. It makes sense. It's what our community uses. So we're gonna keep the word special needs in the title of the document and throughout the document itself. And this is a big one, um, assistive technology tools. What I like about this guide, there's really um, a UDL, Universal Design for Learning spirit in this guide. There's an emphasis 
on differentiated instruction and on equity. So, you know, what does that mean? I, I'll give you an example. Um, one of the things they talk about in the guide, they're like, look, if you have students who have a vision problem, they might need a pair of glasses. And that's okay. We don't, it's not, it's not inequitable to give someone a pair of glasses. That's what they need in order to succeed. And really that's how assistive tech should be looked at in this guide. You know, you can make it available for everyone. Anyone who needs it may need it in order to succeed. So that's covered. And I was going to start, it's in 3.11 and 3.1 of the document, if you're watching the recording, and also in section 3.2. It really talks about that. And if you start reading it, you're like, ah, this is UDL. They're talking also about equity. So it's, it's, it has a nice spirit to the guide too. And in terms of the assistive tech, there's actually four full pages. Matthew and I counted, I think 19 different assistive technologies that are mentioned. But what's nice about them is they don't focus on the tools. It's not like go use, read and write or immersive reader. They really talk about the strategies and the, the spirit of each one of these different assistive technologies you can use. And in, in a good word of advice that our team can put forward, if we're looking at a UDL mindset, a more universal mindset, it's not like, okay, here's 19 assistive technologies, let's teach them to everybody. It's really pick the three that you think would benefit the most students if you are implementing this in your center and stick with those. So these three top assistive technologies, I'm gonna bring up the next slide because I have this in every presentation. What's necessary for some is beneficial for all. We love that. Matthew, I think you really kind of coined that originally, this little spin on it. And I, I'm gonna make a t-shirt printed with that. It's, it's something that we talk about a lot and, and uh, it's in the guide when it talks about assistive technologies. Oh yeah, I definitely didn't coin it, but I, 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 I've, I've heard it oh, and I, I echo it and I'll show it from the rooftops. There's variations on it. I, every yes. time we go, remember we got it from a Canadian. All, anyways, this is the one that we love. We use this all the time. So it's, it's literally in every presentation. I just changed the color of the stars. Anyways, um, <laughs> what does the guide actually look like? Well, we thought at this point of the presentation, probably talked enough. We want to give you, you know, five to 10 minutes to just thumb through the guide. And we don't want to give you any like instruction. Go through it. Take a look. If there's anything, jot it down on a piece of paper. And hopefully it will be addressed in the next section. But if not, we'll talk about it in the open Q&A. So here is... I made a bitly, Matthew, bit.ly slash ASG document, or you can scan the QR code if you want to look it on your phone. It should bring you directly to the guide, okay? So here we go, process. Over to you, Matthew. So in the document, um, you might have noticed, or uh, if you read the full document later on, you'll notice that they talk a lot about, um, there, uh, there's discussion of center teams. And so what, what is the center team? And what are the, the the members' responsibilities? So, I mean, ultimately, the center team—it's um, the members, uh, the support staff, the professionals, um, the administrators, the teachers—who uh, are part of this comprehensive process in order to support the student. Um, ultimately, using the ASG and that the documents that are included um, therein is a team effort. Okay, and the guide is clear about who should be accessing what aspects of the guide. For example, um, there, if there's a portfolio piece with samples of the student's work, that's meant to be maintained by the, the teacher. Um, the prep file with more confidential materials um, from say the youth sector, for example, that's more the administrator's purview. So you can see how an entire team would have to work together, right? To sort of bring to, um, to, uh, to bring together these documents for a cohesive approach. Um, everyone from the special ed tech to the administrator um, should be uh, implicated. So here's some examples of um, uh, center teams. Now, one of the things, one of the many things that was so interesting about putting this, um, about editing this guide and um, putting together the accompanying documents was the opportunity to uh, speak with uh, various staff from different centers. So the templates that we provide you with today were, were developed um, collaboratively. And what, so I went to you know, uh, my centers and asked for samples of how they support, how the, stu the, the student services departments um, or resource centers support students and they provided templates and also strategies. And so all consultants involved in this project went out and did the same thing. 
So all of this to say that um, our edit of the document and the templates we're providing reflect the reality that we have folks working in small centers, medium centers, and large centers across the province. So that's built in um, to this, uh, this infrastructure and, and mechanism we've created. So for example, at a large center, um, you know, you'll have the student services team on board, right? That would usually be where students go for tutoring type services um, or to or for an exam accommodation, for example, if, if it has to be done outside of the classroom. Then there's the resource team, which usually consists of the directors, the consultants, uh, the special ed techs. If you have a readaptation officer or an outreach worker, um, there might be social work technicians. Um, and then also you'll have, of course, the teacher and um, the, uh, the, um, the, the teacher who works directly with the student in the classroom. Then at a medium sized center, you might not have as large a resource team or a full student services team, um, but you certainly have a director and um, you'll have a, a counselor of some kind, a counselor in academic training and um, teachers, right? And then at a small center, maybe this is gonna be more the project of say one resource teacher or a resource teacher with um, a psychoeducator or social work tech. So the idea is that this guide does not necessarily have to be used by the center with the most human resources, okay? Every center can use this guide, okay? So um, there are three important sections of, uh, that are recommended in the ASG, okay? And so these, we, as Avi joked before, we love acronyms, so we figured why not add a few more? Um, so these acronym, acronyms don't translate from French, okay? These are, these are new acronyms, but these um, uh, particular reports and files do exist uh, in the original translation. So, uh, or the original document, sorry. So the first aspect or element is the prep, okay? This is the previous reports and education plans. So you might not have anything, that's okay, okay? A student can still have a CARE and an ASAP without the prep, okay? But what goes in the prep, these are the confidential files. So if you have a medical note indicating that a student has had hearing loss, Okay, um, if they have an IEP from the youth sector that they've presented to you, um, or that might have been like forwarded to you in a transition meeting, um, or reports from professionals, whether in adult ed or uh, youth sector. So this might be like a psychoeducational uh, uh, assessment. And so you can see why this, this file is particular, particularly sensitive and why the guide calls for it to be under the purview of administration. Doesn't mean that um, other staff can't access it, but it's something that uh, like the the security of the document is the responsibility of the administration. Then there's the care, which is the competency analysis, reports, and evaluations. So I mentioned the word portfolio before. If there's a portfolio of a student, student work um, from a past year, um, if they've been at the center for a while, or just something that is uh, that the teaching staff is beginning to put together now for the purposes of helping the student, um, that can be included in the care. Uh, so again, any, any portfolio of the student's work could just be a writing sample. Um, the document will give an example of a 350 word um, you know, essay that a student has written that is exemplary of either their strengths or their difficulties could be included in the care. Um, it can also be a place to um, document needs, whether it's just like a simple checklist that perhaps a special ed tech has observed in the classroom um, or supports and interventions that have been implemented previously and um, successfully, hopefully. Now, the final uh, step is to take, is to put together the ASAP. Now the ASAP is the adult ed version of the IEP. Okay, so in the youth sector, if a student is coded um, or um, uh, has been granted I, an IEP, it's important to note that that IEP is a legal document, right? Um, it's, not, uh, it's not optional that, uh, that, the, that the, the staff can, can maintain that document. It must be used and respected and, and revised. Um, we that wasn't an automatic thing in adult ed okay in iep we also don't have the same resources or infrastructure to implement them in in the youth sector so a youth sector will have like a psychologist who is supporting the iep we might not we won't have that in adult education most likely so the adult ed version of the iep is called the asap so the adult support education plan 
So what does it have? Um, it has signatures of the student, of the teacher, of the administrator, indicating that everything um, that everything that is in the ASAP has been reviewed with a student and approved. So everything in there has been sort of validated by the current situation and has been approved by the student and administration. It'll have a summary of the needs that are perhaps outlined in the care. So the care might have a series of checklists or observations, whether it's tied to behavior um, or learning difficulties over a session, a year, a number of years. That's a lot for someone like a teacher to go through and make sense of. But as professionals or whoever's involved with um, the design of the ASAP, we can take those, uh, create a summary of those needs and interventions and strategies. Uh, the ASAP wouldn't contain a sample essay. You'd have to go to the care package to see that. But um, some of the strategies that would help support produce a stronger essay um, or would support some of the difficulties that have been highlighted in the essay um, would be outlined in the ASAP. And then another important piece is the accommodations. So the exam accommodations that are authorized will also be included in the ASAP. So think of it as um, a profile of the student's strengths, um, areas that require attention, strategies for supporting those areas of attention, um, adaptations that teachers should do in the classroom as, as best practices for supporting that student's learning, but also official exam accommodations that are not negotiable, okay? The adaptations, a teacher can sort of, you know, um, ad adapt the material in a way that they feel will benefit the student, and they're supposed to be doing that, but in terms of what they must do, if, an if the student has a document, uh, has a note in the file indicating that they need to use speech to text software to complete an exam, that's not negotiable. They have to have access to that. How would you know that? It'll be in the ASAP. The, the ASAP and the ASG checklist were two documents that we created as part of the team. So the ASAP, that adult ed IEP, came from all the consultants involved and was reviewed by all the reviewed by all the consultants involved and was built on pre-existing pre adult ed IEPs, not called ASAPs because we didn't know the terminology, right? That's one of the reasons we're doing this because we want people to use the same terminology instead of saying, you know, oh, my adult IEP, or I've seen various acronyms or different permutations of how to express IEP in the absence of the language. Well, now we have it, it's an ASAP. Um, so this uh, checklist, is how to put in place um, the different strategies and recommendations, how to put together a PrEP, a CARE, um, and uh, an ASAP. And this was um, a, a mostly Shanna's work. So Shanna Loach uh, put this together and she's just so great at like synthesizing ideas wherever, and, and suggestions. And so um, Abby, can you just open this up and um, we'll scroll through it super quick. Okay, the ASG is not a living document. All right. If we notice anything like, you know, glaringly problematic with the 45 page guide, we can go in and change things. But really, you know, it, it's validated as is and it there shouldn't be any, there can't be any substantial changes. Um, however, this checklist and the ASAP template itself are completely modifiable. Like you could even choose to ignore them completely. I don't recommend that. I mean, because mm -hmm. I think they're great documents, but I'm also heavily biased. Um, but all that to say that the ASG, that, that, that will, will not change, whereas this checklist and the ASAP itself can change. And in fact, we encourage folks to change things that are in uh, those documents. Now, this summary tool, sometimes I'm like, Avi, for a whole presentation, we should just spend it on this because it is that great. Um, but um, the checklist provides a summary of all the things, some of the things we were talking about today, but all the most salient points from the ASG. Um, so from the full guide itself. So what is the center team? What are they supposed to do? It's defined for you here. Um, what is an individualized approach? Um, what kind of measures can we use? All of these things are uh, defined in this document. Now, I want to point out, uh, remind you of two things in case we haven't stated them explicitly, is that this um, support, got, this, um, sorry, checklist is summarizing information from two key documents. One is the administration guide, administrative guide, certification of studies and management of ministerial examinations. That 
um, document that was created in 2009 and updated in 2015 is not like everything in there is a directive. You got you have to do what's in there, and that's what the exam accommodations are. Okay, so that is a directive from the ministry. If you want to give an accommodation, you have to follow the rules that are in that document and for anything else having to do with exams. Now, where we come in is our guide for ensuring consistent and effective support for adult learners with special needs, our ASG. These are guidelines. These are things that centers should do, that teaching staff should do, that professionals should do, but they're not law, okay? Directives, we have to. These guidelines, we should do. So if you're wondering what goes in these documents, okay, um, you can refer back to the presentation that Avi and I are sharing with you right now, or you can go to the full, the full 45 page document, or you could just come here. So what goes in the previous reports and education plans? What goes in the prep? Past recommendations, authorization forms, um, reports from the classroom, um, IEPs, and um, uh, professional evaluations. Okay, that's what goes in the prep. And so this is in checklist form if you wanna take off what you have for students. Then there's the competency analysis, reports and evaluations. This is the care section or the care package, I'm starting to call it. Um, <laughs> it documents the adult learner's progression, a summary, a synthesis of um, the existing files, right? So a teacher might not need to see the original psychoeducational assessment, but you might summarize parts of it here with which to build the ASAP interventions, supports put in place. We might have things like incident reports in here, um, validations of, of modifications or interventions. So um, sometimes you might have recommended, for example, the use of um, speech to text technology for a student, but maybe that changed and the student did not require that anymore. Or maybe you were using read and write and now you've switched to Kurzweil. That would be something that you could note in here and would help the team build the ASAP. Um, you can all, this is also where the teacher can contribute um, portfolio type materials, right? Such as a uh, sample essay, um, uh, a quiz, um, something that they think is uh, demonstrative of the student's work. And then finally, the ASAP. This is the adult ed IEP. Um, again, we'll look at the template for it. Um, and the template that we'll share with you today was actually edited very recently because Avi and I worked on it with one of uh, one of our teams at Karche and I'll get to that in a second. Um, so you'll be able to see what it you know looks like fully in a second, but what's in there? Adult identification section. How do we identify the adult? Again, what we present to you today is just a version of that, okay? It would be up to you as a team to decide what ultimately goes in there. We can list objectives, uh, the learner's needs, the support measures that are used, whether human material or technology based, the reports added, right? So you might not put everything from the care or from the prep, you would put what is most salient right now, right? Um, the, the, what are the roles of the center teams? Who's responsible for following the student right now? That is the kind of thing that would be documented in the ASAP. And also um, an important section is uh, the follow-up. Who's gonna follow up on this? Um, we likely aren't gonna put an ASAP in for a student once, right? It takes a lot of work to do this. Um, we wanna make sure it's for the student who really needs it and who's gonna be an adult ed for say more than just like catching up on a course for two weeks, right? So we need to you know, show the validity of, uh, of creating this document, um, but also ensuring that we follow up on this document because it takes a lot of work to produce. And then of course, there's gonna be a section for signatures. Um, Avi, could, could you please open the document and we can, have a look. So I emphasized previously um, the difference between the supports and the authorized measures, right? So the supports, the adaptations are the things that you'll do every day in the classroom to support the students learning. That might be doing something such as um, suggesting that they, the teacher provides them access with Google Read and Write, but using the Google Read and Write in an, um, in an exam is tricky because it has to be online, right? So in the exam, you might also indicate that the student will be uh, able to use text to speak technology, but you would be using Kurzweil or WordQ since you can use those offline in, so as to not compromise the exams, right? So you see how read and write, it's pretty accessible to anyone who has a Google account. That would be an adaptation, but for that to become an accommodation, you would have to look at a different tool for one thing and then demonstrate that the student needed Google read and write to succeed. 
um, and then that would become a more um, like concretized um, accommodation in the ASAP itself. So just going through um, the ASAP, um, you'll see the kind of information we have in here. Again, like this, this we 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 literally just uh, uh, edited last week because we had our idea that was based on all the different centers uh, uh, templates that they had previously created. And we put one together that we thought sort of spoke to all of those experiences. And then we uh, edited a, a bunch more times because we kept finding things. Then we decided that why don't we actually use it with a team? So Avi and I worked with the Endeavor special ed techs and the Seed special ed tech and the um, SV, uh, the um, Thrive special ed techs. So those are our S all of our SI and SBI programs at Lester B. We got the special ed techs in one room for two hours and uh, we had them uh, go through this. So our first step was we had them all edit edit a version of this. Uh, we gave them a couple minutes to sort of work through it and take out what they wouldn't need and um, add in what was missing. And then Avi and I edited it on the spot. And then we actually got them to create an ASAP for a student, like kind of like a mock situation. So what did the Endeavor and Thrive and Seed um, spec ed text come up with? This, this document ultimately. So the idea was that they needed to make it their own for their particular context. Every center should be doing this as well. Again, uh, you could use it as is, or you can change um, whatever you like in it, okay? Without deviating too far from what's prescribed in the guide. So here are things we thought were important for proficiency in English, proficiency in French. Um, we wanted a list of community uh, resource support personnel. Right. Um, again, this is editable. Let's say the student doesn't have um, a resource person in the community. Well, take that section out. Right. Um, or if they have more than five, <laughs> add more. Um, going on to the next page, you can see the objectives that will set for the student as well as the desired results. Who suggested these? Um, the date of this version. So when we were looking at um, students in social integration, for example, many of them were in our programs for three or four years. So we need to have a, a document that we can that that will evolve over that time. So it's important to, to know that if once you create one of these students, uh, these ASAPs for the, your students, you need to go back and edit it. But it should be noted that you did that, right? Um, that way we can consult previous versions. And then we should be um, summarizing what what did we cover this year in the ASAP? Were there marked imp improvements? Does the student still need to be on an ASAP next year? or is this something we would review in September? Then we scroll down and we put a pretty exhaustive list of the different supports that you can use in the classroom. So math support tools, visual um, graphic organizers, um, memory aids, um, assistive tech. So again, these are the adaptations. These are things that are good to provide in the classroom, but these are not the exam accommodations, okay? Um, scrolling down, we have a list of folks who are responsible for the ASAP. Now, you'll notice that um, we didn't put the exam accommodations right after the adaptations. And that's because for our students in Endeavor, our social integration students, they aren't doing ministry exams. So we weren't gonna have the exam accommodations part um, in the, um, in, in, uh, right after the adaptations. So next, this is the care package. Um, what information have we gleaned from um, the competency analysis reports and evaluations? Things about their attitude. Um, their, so this is, this is their strength section. What are the strengths that we're able to glean from documents that already exist or conversations we've had with staff? Then we can add some notes. And then we have the needs. So the areas of difficulty, everything from compliance to attendance to planning or an organization, um, different stressors that are impacting their learning and observations and what supports have been put in place. Then section three is the prep. Now there's nothing saying you can't take the prep and have that as the first or second section in here. This is just the way that we decided to do this in consultation with the special ed tax at Endeavor. So what, what do we have um, from the previous reports? This is the list, IEP intervention plans, speech and language pathology reports, OT reports, social work reports, maybe a music therapy report. Again, these are uh, aspects that would be in, you know, what your administrator might refer to as their confidential file. 
We also put the diagnosis, relevant medical diagnosis. You might decide that um, an ASD diagnosis is not relevant because the student's current need is more tied to mental health. Okay, then that's a decision that you would make with the team and with the student. You might decide that you want to have all of the diagnoses because you feel that that is essential to create in this document. That is valid too. I can't echo enough what Matthew is saying. When we talk to different centers and different people, there's a very, um, there's a divide between that if the diagnosis should be included in the ASAP or not, but it is available as a Word document. So if you're implementing this in your center, you make that decision. But for example, the eight special ed techs we're working with all said the diagnosis would inform the way they would work with the students. So they really wanted it back in there. So we put it back. And keep in mind, you know, you might sit down with a student and they'll say, I don't want that in there. And you have to say, okay, because they're not going to sign it if there's something in there that they don't agree to. Yeah, very good point, Matthew. Ah, here you go, number four. And so we get to the declarations and signatures. Um, this is where you review, uh, where you um, can attest to the fact that you've, um, that you reviewed this with the student. Uh, it also provides an overview of the actual exam accommodations that you're allowed to provide. So here, um, I, you know, let's say halfway through the school year, the teacher has noticed that perhaps the student could use um, some uh, text-to-speech technology in the exams, but you haven't validated that. So what you might do is suspect that and actually try it in class with read and write as like my go-to example, and then recommend that in here. But just because you've recommended that they be able to use um, that kind of technology in an exam doesn't mean that it's approved yet. So this is where you might actually have to show, you know, a student's grade, you know, was, was higher or they were able to complete the entire assignment because they had access to that technology. And then where do you document that? In the ASAP, show it to your administrator and your administrator would likely approve the accommodation. So here you can show where you've recommended a specific exam accommodation, okay? Not an adaptation for the classroom, but an exam accommodation and, and um, if it's been approved by administration. And this has been taken from 522, the administrative guide that Matthew mentioned from 2015, word for word copy paste. And so if you scroll, you scroll down there, again, there are some things you might take out, like for Endeavor, when we finalize this, we will likely take out the exam accommodations because we're not administering exams uh, with the current program. But um, for many other, well, for most other courses, you would include that. So you see the acknowledgement of the support measures, the signatures for the entire document, and that constitutes the ASAP. 12 pages is pretty, um, pretty comprehensive. All right, so I'm also, thanks so much, Matthew. Sure. Um, I'm looking at the time, and we really wanna leave time for questions. So I'm gonna share two slides, and then we're just gonna open up the floor to any questions that you may have at this point. So we're gonna share again, um, two different bit.ly's with you. Again, for those of, of you that were not here at the beginning of the presentation, there is a link bit.ly slash APC 2022 ASG. That's the presentation you've been looking at. And if you go to this one here, bit.ly slash age support guide, easy to remember, won't ever change. It will bring you directly over to the Google Drive with the ASG, with the templates, with the um, checklist, everything you need in there. And we update it as we go along. As Matthew said, the ASG is not a living document unless there's something major we found in there, but the other documents will change over time and you're able to edit them to your heart's content. Um, offer of workshops. If you are interested in a workshop around this, just reach out. Um, there might be someone on the ESG team who works already at your center and they'd be the best person to do that. Um, if you're not sure, um, I've offered to be the coordinator for that. You can just reach out to me, aspector at rsb.qc.ca and I can put you in touch with the right person or we can do something online like this or do something more hands-on. Today's really just to give um, an overview of the whole, the whole process. So are there any questions from the presentation. I'll start if that's okay. Okay, okay. Sure. so my first question was about the IEP. Um, so I've been told here from our, our representatives that the IEP is not necessarily accepted immediately, um, that we have to reevaluate the students' learning needs again. Yes. 
So in the document, it does specify that you can take, for example, in the prep file, an IEP, and you can use that to inform um, the creation of the RACEP. Okay. So it doesn't mean that we'll actually apply the IEP from high school to us and just as it is. No, because things may have changed over right. time. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Okay, I have two things. You had mentioned that the, the document is like is not an evolving document, but if any change at all is possible, I would really appreciate a clickable table of contents. I found I was like scrolling up and down. I didn't have enough time to actually, I couldn't find some things. Because there was, I, I, I would get lost in the it's section 31.2 and I, in my head, it was page 31. And then I went, oh, no, wait a second. That was section. So I'm going to go back up. So um, if, if ever you do a revision, that would be like really welcome. Um, taken. Sorry, Trace. I think we could do that right away. It's just more if we're changing the content yeah. of it or the language in there at this point would be more difficult, but we could add hyperlinks. I am laughing. It just makes it like easier I, to access the information because it is 100%. It's not like a 10 page document. It's it's a pretty long document. In the original um, French document, it is hyperlinked. And that's one thing when we published uh, for a variety of technical reasons, we're like, okay, we're just going to put it out like this. But it's I'm laughing because it's interesting to hear that it is needed. So therefore, I think we do need to put that back in. So thanks for the comment. Thank you. Um, and the next thing, it's about the role of the student or student and or caregivers, like, because, uh, you know, sometimes the caregivers are, you know, student is given um, permission for caregivers to be, uh, you know, an active role, to play an active role. And so, like, I haven't read the whole, the whole, whole document, but in certain areas, there's like kind of an emphasis on how important it is to have conversations that the student is part of, of, of this, um, that their involvement is super important but they're absent from the process in a sense that like the center teams, I don't see the student as part of a team. And within all of the checklists of like who to ask questions or you know, the, the student isn't really there except for when it comes time to sign the document, sign off on it. So I'm just wondering how, like, a, because because we can fall into the trap and, and and I've fallen into it before many times of making you know talking about students and about what's best for them without involving them in the conversation and then you get to the end of it and they say I'm not signing this you know you know what I mean so I'm just wondering how that uh, it's an excellent point because it is indicated in the ASAP that the student will be involved at that part but they're getting everything towards the end of the process so. I'm going to defer back to Karine or Matthew. Um, oui, parce que dans le fond, là, ce qui est décrit là-dedans, c'est vraiment pour faire le, le care in, puis faire les rapports, mais tout avant, parce que souvent, l'élève nous arrive avec son plan d'intervention. Donc, c'est lui qui fait l'action de nous l'apporter. Donc, il est, il, il est au courant. Et sinon, les suivis se font dans les rencontres de tutorat. Fait que ça, le document comme ça, il n'est pas, pas pour le tutorat, mais c'est sûr que par une communication, par un feedback constant de l'enseignant, on l'implique dans tous les processus. Et dans les signatures, à la fin, l'élève, il doit signer. Là. Oui, mais c'est comme l'élève, I'm, I'm just, I'm thinking about, comme même dans le, dans le secteur des jeunes, ça, ça, ça arrive très souvent comme ça que, comme, qu'on parle de l'élève comme c'est le tuteur qui va amener les intérêts de l'apprenant de, de et non l'apprenant. Mm -hmm. Mais quand l'apprenant est impliqué, c'est comme est impliqué euh, vraiment comme euh, au premier plan, là. Euh, c'est là où l'apprenant va être plus, I think, more euh, euh, engagé, Il va être engagé plus... dans son oui. plan, que ce n'est pas quelque chose qu'on fait pour moi. Mais en fait, c'est ça, c'est une volonté de le mettre. Euh, en avant-plan, hein? mmh. c'est euh, pareil euh, euh, comme au, au secteur des jeunes. Donc, effectivement, dans toutes les rencontres de discussion, ce qu'on essaie d'amener, c'est une discussion préalable avec, avec l'enseigne, avec l'élève, pour que l'équipe école qui va rédiger le plan là, puisse le faire. Là. Mais il faut que l'élève soit au courant de, toutes les, euh, de tous les processus avant même d'utiliser des outils, parce que sinon, mm. euh, il ne les utilisera pas, il ne se sentira pas interpellé. 
Mais pourquoi il n'est pas comme dans, dans le, le, le regroupement de l'équipe? If that makes sense. Il ne fait pas partie de l'équipe, l'apprenant. Bien, pas dans, les, pas dans les rapports à... Pas dans la reddition de rapports, mais effectivement, ce serait bien de l'inclure. I think so. Mais, je, je pense que c'est le, le, le document qu'ils ont, tra qu ont traduit, que l'équipe AV a, a traduit, qui fait ça. Mais dans les processus et comment ça se vit dans le secteur francophone, euh, il est impliqué là, dès le départ. Yeah. Okay, so Tracy, I just want to reiterate back just to make sure we're on the same page. So you're saying basically in the document, it does say, you know, this should be done in concert with the student and whatnot. Whereas there's the care file, which you're gathering all those checklists and observations and things, and it's not being explicit enough about where to involve the student. And even more so in the center team, you're not seeing the word student in there. So it seems yeah. like there's a contradiction. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, there's a little bit of a, it seems there's a bit of a contradiction, like there's this idea that it's very important that the student is responsible for their learning and that they recognize, you know, what they're able to, you know, that, that they recognize that their role in this, yet they don't, they, they, they're not officially a part of the process, other than yeah. it's important to include them. Do you know what I mean? Everything yeah, else seems very like ticks and, you know, it is very um, highlighted and delineated, but And I'm not saying this, like, it's just, it's, this is the process that's been put forward by this, by whoever made this original document, right? Okay, yeah, that's really good feedback. Thank you, Tracy. Moi, j'ai une remarque, une question aussi. Um, à la page 12, vous parlez d'un outil de trace qui est le portfolio. Puis là, Karine, j'aurai besoin de ton aide. Moi, c'est comme nouveau. Je ne sais pas si c'est dans la version française de portfolio, mais moi, je ne l'ai jamais vu. Je trouve que c'est un outil extraordinaire. Mais je ne l'ai jamais vu utiliser. Est-ce qu'il est utilisé présentement du côté anglophone? Et je reviens aussi à la remarque de Tracy. C'est-à-dire que est-ce que l'élève peut choisir ou il y a un, il y a un droit de regard sur ce qu'on va mettre dans le portfolio? Ou bien c'est tout simplement un portfolio comme un portfolio d'évaluation qui est décidé par l'équipe qui, qui entoure l'élève? Oui, c'est une bonne, bonne question. Um, dans les documents, il y a une mention de... Um... Le, la possibilité d'inclure um, un, por un portfolio. Alors, je ne peux pas vous donner comme un exemple de comment c'est utilisé dans ce moment-là, mais c'est une, une, bonne, une bonne question puis un, un, un bon point, euh, Richard. Je pense que peut-être on pourrait être un peu plus comme spécifique avec um, la, la langage um, autour de um, l'utilisation du portfolio et, Qu'est-ce qui est là-dedans et c'est qui qui fait la décision qui va être um, dans le portfolio? Um, so just the, oui, you know, oui mais je trouve que c'est une excellente idée, mais là, Karine, je pose la question à toi. Est-ce que c'est fait du côté francophone? Oui. On monte des portfolios? On monte des portfolios, mais on ne l'associe pas à l'évaluation. On l'associe à quand on est à recueillir des, des traces. Mm. à savoir si un outil est mieux qu'un autre, si une aide est spécifique qu'un autre. Ou pour savoir les méthodes de travail, on va utiliser différentes traces de l'élève. C'est comme ça, ce portfolio-là, dans le document qui est présenté, qui, qui est abordé. Là. Est, ça n'a pas du tout rapport à l'évaluation. Mm. Je, je pense qu'il y a une explication, un contexte, que c'est quelque chose qui, um, uh, qui est important d'inclure pour faire... Uh, pour, um, Uh, uh, to make the case for using a specific ad adaptation, right? Uh, mais il n'y a pas comme, une, uh, y a, y a pas, pas comme une, uh, une, uh, une explication de, de, de qu'est-ce qui est là-dedans spécifiquement. Oui, parce que c'est assez rare qu'on mentionne un outil ouais. spécifique dans un, ouais. dans un document. C'est la première fois que, tu sais, habituellement, on dit, bon, choisissez le document que vous voulez, mais là, on dit, mm. prenez un portfolio Mm. Puis il n'y a pas d'autres ouais. exemples. Je dis, oh, wow, c'est rare qu'on qu suggère un outil. Là. Mais que je trouve ça intéressant. Mm. Puis en tout cas, moi, personnellement, je ne l'avais jamais vu. Puis on, il y a eu une période où on disait le portfolio, c'est bon pour tout. L'élève, par exemple, si on prend un élève au début, on dit voici comment il dessine une main hein, au préscolaire. Puis après ça, en sixième année, voici comment il dessine sa main. Puis on peut voir exactement le progrès qui était. Oui. Mais c'est peu utilisé, en tout cas chez aux jeunes, il est peu utilisé au régulier. Je ne sais pas si avec les élèves en besoin, besoin particulier, c'est plus utilisé, mais c'est un super outil. Mais j'aimerais ça, en tout cas, comme tu disais, Mathieu, qu'il soit défini qui met quoi dedans. Parce que l'élève, je pense que des fois, il aimerait mettre quelque chose. Voici ce que 
ce que je veux vous montrer, ce que je suis capable de faire ou ce que je ne suis pas capable de faire. Oui, et pour moi, je, je travaille principalement dans, en IS, puis nos élèves ont des portfolios. Et, et vu que les élèves sont dans nos programmes pour deux, trois, quatre ans, on a, on a, on a plus, um, on a un dossier plus, plus épais avec plus de matériaux. Mais je pense dans une, une, si on a une élève qui, est dans, um, qui, qui prend ses cours de secondaire 4, puis ils sont avec nous juste pour un an, c'est c'est probable qu'on n'a pas trop de matériaux à, pour populer un portfolio. Mais je pense qu'on pourrait être un peu plus comme spécifique à, avec des exemples de, de quoi mettre là-dedans et comment l'étudiant et l'enseignant sont impliqués dans le, la création du portfolio. OK, so um, I, excuse, just a quick question. First of all, I want to say I love the, uh, the, the explanation. I love the documents that you've created. And it's clarified so many things for me that uh, working as an English teacher in a French board, I don't see those documents ever. Um, and I've only found out in the last five years that IEP exists. So my question is, if I wanted to talk to my administration, who, who builds these files? Is it the teacher responsible or is it uh, who, like, who does it? Or, yeah. Thank you. I think that's the million dollar question with IEPs and, and support projects. <laughs> Sorry, I'll, I'll let Matthew. <laughs> I, I, yeah, no, I, Tracy's right. It is the million dollar question, but I think the guide's pretty clear in terms of how to get started and what the different teams could work with. So like Michelle, my suggestion to you would be share this with your administrator. Um, you know, administrators are busy, so you could always start with just the checklist um, mm -hmm. and say, you know, here's here's an overview of what is included in this document, but they can also have the, the 45 pager as well. And I think it'd be you sit down with them and say, well, who would be on the team to so, to implement this? And I think that would be a good starting point. Cool. So two so things. Not, oh, sorry. It's not, ahead, specifically, it's not specifically the pedagogical. No, no, no. That helps me with academics. It's and it's not the lady that does the profiles for the students coming in. It. So you would need information from um, yeah. each of those folks, like the right. whoever is doing intake for the students and creating their profiles. That you would need their support for. But really, in order to to get this process going, you just need the student and the teacher, okay. right, to establish the need. Okay. Perfect. And Michelle, I'm just going to jump in. If you're coming from a French board, you could go to the original French documents of this also. They're very close. We did try to keep it close in spirit. I do believe we actually mentioned the center team and broke it out who it could be. But that, just letting you know, the French version might be useful for you well, too at your board. I did take note. Somebody wrote care and then they gave the French equivalent. So I took note of that. So I appreciated that very much. So thank so you. Page two of our guide has the equivalents in French. But if you look in our presentation, Karine, you can help me here. It's a ligne directrice pour des besoins. There's a whole, c'est quoi le titre en français? C'est les lignes directrices pour assurer la cohérence des actions pour les élèves à besoins particuliers. Et il y en a un pour la FP, parce que là, aujourd'hui, on vous a présenté celui de la FGA. Et c'est que les mesures adaptatives ne sont pas les mêmes en FP qu'en FGA, mais les lignes directrices sont aussi pour la FP. Il y en existe aussi. Merci. Le responsable, en fait, c'est une équipe école, mais la direction doit mettre un responsable des services éducatifs complémentaires. Généralement, c'est un TES, psycho ça peut être un, un orthopédagogue, un resource teacher. C'est quelqu'un qui, qui porte le, 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 le mandat, mais c'est sûr que les enseignants, c'est les premiers intervenants concernés parce que c'est eux qui voient les élèves le plus. And I was just going to say, this could also be a really good time to involve the student and asking them, who would you like to, who would you like to be the point person for something like this? Because it needs to be someone that they are comfortable with and they feel safe with, right? They're not going to, if I'm a student and there's that scary teacher over there and I'm told they're the one who's in charge, I'm not going to like, yeah, right. you know what I mean? Any more questions? I mean, I could talk about this all night. But, uh, yeah, I'm available <laughs> if anyone wants to sit around and ask, uh, talk more. I really appreciate the information. It was very helpful for me. It's a good starting point for sure. So thank you, everyone. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for coming tonight. We put our heart and soul into this guide. I love the feedback. 
Thank you also, Tracy, for the feedback around the students. And we're going to see what we can do to incorporate that. So uh, yeah.